action. Thank you very much, Dr. Jenkins. Thank you very much. You hear me okay? So, number one, I'm an interventional cardiologist, and two, I never dreamed that I would be speaking to uh, people in this capacity that uh, perform cardiac surgery because what I do for a living is try to prevent people from having to be treated by you guys. So, in that respect, I first have to tell you a little bit about the history, epidemiology. I'll show you a few slides on uh, the Angiovac uh, device and then I'll show you how it came into our hands and what we use it for. So that means I need to give you a little bit of update on venous thromboembolism. I proctor and speak for a couple of companies, none of which has anything to do with this talk. Now, if you look at the epidemiology of venous thromboembolism, it occurs in one per thousand per year in the U.S., of which two-thirds have DVT alone, approximately a third of them have pulmonary embolism associated with it. It's responsible for a quarter of a million hospital admits per year, of which 30% die within a month, 30% have recurrent venous thromboembolism within eight to 10 years, and if you have pulmonary embolism associated with that, you have an extremely high mortality. It accounts for, if you count first time and recurrent venous thromboembolism, that's roughly a million people per year in the U.S. That incidence has not changed over the last 25 years. And if you compare those to age and gender match controls, people who have clots and thrombus have a much higher mortality rate. It is the number three killer in the United States of America. Now, it comes with a host of consequences. Uh, the post-thrombotic syndrome, and I will not regurgitate that list, which is uh, the main thing that we do as interventionalists to try to remove this thrombus. The chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, and then this increased associated mortality. In this New England Journal article published by Pango in 2004, he followed 355 patients who had first-time venous thromboembolism for eight years, and they had a 30% incidence of recurrence of this disease within that eight years of follow, a 30% uh, incidence of post-thrombotic syndrome, and a 30% incidence of death. So if you learn nothing today about the Angivac device or any of these other perfusion technologies, just remember the number 30% because that's the only number I've mentioned. And if you ever ask a question about venous thromboembolism, the answer is 30%. Now, that cost the U.S. healthcare dollars roughly $1.85 billion per year to care for treatment of this disease and for the long-term so quality treatment, et cetera. The standard treatment options that I've had in my armamentarium in the past have been pharmacologic, I could anticoagulate or give thrombolytics, and then the mechanical, such as sticking tiny catheters in these large vessels with clot in them, or asking a surgeon, which as I told you, that's the other side that I try to prevent people to go to, to do pulmonary embolectomies. Now, if we look at evidence-based guidelines from uh, the American College of uh, Chest Physicians, uh, European College of uh, uh, Society of Cardiology, the Society of Interventional Radiology, they traditionally have had guidelines that have only addressed our acute and chronic therapies for this disease, such as the anticoagulation, how long, what to give, how to follow them, et cetera. They've given absolutely zero guidance until they've been all updated in the recent year or two for guidance in how we could treat these people with the more invasive interventional techniques. Now, recognizing that void in the literature, the ACCAHA has never had guidelines until March of 2011. And recognizing that void in the literature, they published guidelines. So I want to briefly go over those, then I'll tell you about the two slides on Angiovac and go from there. Now, I was actually on this writing committee, so I think that uh, qualifies me to tell you about these guidelines. If the guidelines that we have as invasive people that you'll be supporting to use this device do what we call catheter-directed thrombolysis or pharmacomechanical catheter-directed thrombolysis. And we have guidelines now to follow for that. And those guidelines are, if you have limb-threatening circulatory compromise, that is the highest level of indication, a class one indication, which means the benefit is greater, greater, greater than the risk of performing the procedure, 
for some sort of treatment for thrombus removal. If you are a patient who presented an institution that has no expertise in this, it's a class one indication to then transfer you to a center that does. And it's also an indication for this treatment if you have uh, deterioration despite anticoagulation. It is considered a frontline indication to prevent these long-term sequelae of post-thrombotic syndrome. It is contraindicated for uh, systemic fibrinolysis for treatment of this disease unless you have it from in your pulmonary vasculature or cardiac structures. And if you have thrombus that's greater than 21 days of age, then it's contraindicated because you've had fibrocyte ingrowth, organization, and you no longer have jello. You basically have rubber bands, et cetera, that are very difficult to remove with techniques that an interventionalist would use. Now, we've traditionally divided it into proximal and distal DVT, which is woefully inadequate for the purposes of determining who should be treated with an invasive procedure versus a more conservative procedure. That division, and, and proximal and distal is divided at the knee traditionally in our literature. But instead, we should make that division at the level of the common femoral vein. And the reason for that is that the common femoral vein obstructs not only your God-given primary outflow to drain your low extremities, but it also uh, occludes any possible collateral pathway that can drain your lower extremity. So from common femoral and up, then an invasive technique such as this is appropriate. The common femoral and below, uh, the more uh, conservative territory, you should consider uh, more conservative measures, uh, not devices like this, not catheter-directed thrombolysis, et cetera. You could give medical therapy and do just fine. Now what we've been faced with as someone in my position is that a typical case of this requires balloon angioplasty, multiple modalities, uh, mechanical thrombectomy, catheter-directed thrombolysis, lots of stents, uh, lots of time, uh, lots of expensive stay in the ICU, et cetera. So something that would do this quickly and remove it versus a 48, 72-hour ICU stay with uh, drips in and bleeding all over the bed, et cetera, would be much favorable. So that's where this Angiovac device comes in. And not only does it treat uh, large objects, uh, debris, clot, et cetera, in cardiac structures, it does it in the iliac veins, uh, you can put it in the inferior vena cava, uh, and you can go out into the pulmonary vasculature with it. The device has uh, a set of uh, uh, tubes and connectors and hoses that are thrown towards you guys. It has a filter uh, that you place on your uh, centrifugal pump and then it has this proprietary catheter that comes in an original flavor and then a 20 degree bin which was developed later on so that it could be used to manipulate better. It looks something like this. Uh, it's basically a large catheter that's placed uh, in some vein. It's aspirated out to this filter which then filters out the debris and then it's run by the centrifugal pump and then it's dumped back in whatever access you can find. Uh, it uses a 22 French, uh, very rigid walled catheter so that the suction from your centrifugal pump will not collapse this, and then it has this balloon on the end that inflates to keep it from suctioning up next to your structure. You can put it in from up above, you can uh, aspirate SVCs, cardiac structures, etc. You can go from below, go into the veins. Now, so. 11 minutes and 38 seconds. So I have uh, roughly nine minutes and I'll go through as many cases as I can with you just to demonstrate uh, how the device is used. So this is an echo. Uh, there's your right atrium, your, uh, your right ventricle. And this is uh, a pulmonary embolism in thrombus. Most likely came from your lower extremities. Uh, it's embolized up the inferior vena cava and it's sitting in your right atrium. This is just another view, a cross-sectional view showing it here in the right atrium, your right ventricle, pulmonary valve, uh, it goes over like that. There's your aorta sitting in the middle. A CT scan of that, you can see the white, here's your contrast. Here you can see these big snakes sitting out in the, in the left and the right uh, pulmonary veins. Uh, you can see where the flow's uh, oozing and, and getting around that. 
Um, this is just a cross-sectional view. You can see the dark area here is a pulmonary artery almost completely filled with thrombus, uh, something that would elude uh, any type of device that I've had until I got this large bore vacuum cleaner. Here you see a uh, contrast where it leaks around the edge, goes out into your pulmonary uh, vessels. And there shows another pretty good image of that. So here, this is just a 3D reconstruction. Uh, you can see the pulmonary artery coming up. Here's the left main stem uh, pulmonary artery. And so what you're doing is limiting flow large time. Now, if you notice this angiogram where we injected from the superior vena cava here, what I want you to focus on is as the blood comes in the right atrium and right ventricle and goes out the pulmonary artery, I want you to notice the paucity of this vasculature. Here's your pulmonary artery, here's your right, or, and here's your left, and just play this one more time and I'll move on. But notice how the pulmonary arteries don't feel very well out here. You see some contrast going into them, but you don't see it blush like we typically do. So here's this device. Here's the balloon up on it. There's the little funnel. Uh, here's this large, uh, uh, usually we use a, a dry seal sheath uh, that we put in these to, you know, because these are need good hemostatic valves on the top not to lose a lot of blood. It's pushed out into the main pulmonary artery. Uh, there it is going in and out of the right pulmonary artery. There it is over into the left pulmonary artery. And when you see these little tips right here, shutter and then you guys start whining about your machines not aspirating, that means that you've actually caught a fish. So you need to pull it out and weigh it and see what it looks like. Now notice the angiogram here after we inject, after we've aspirated with this device. So what I want you to notice is how much better these pulmonary arteries out here feel after you've aspirated this debris. And up until large bore aspiration devices, uh, hit the market, we've had nothing that we could treat this percutaneously short of uh, doing an invasive procedure and having your cardiovascular surgeon uh, uh, put these patients on bypass and then uh, uh, do pulmonary embolectomy, which I'm sure most of you have, uh, have participated in. So there's the filter and what it looks like. Uh, there's the thrombus that came out of it. Uh, there's the tip of the catheter that was digging around in the mud. And this is, looks like a saddle embolus that was sitting in the main pulmonary artery. Uh, and here's the two pieces that go out. What you notice here is that these are different color. So the more dark stuff is the more fresh thrombus. And the lighter stuff is, is so you always have varying uh, chronicity of thrombus when you go and try to remove this because thrombus begets thrombus and the you know, old thrombus that has fibrocyte ingrowth is then these rubber balls that you, know, you can't treat with small devices. Uh, this may be more fresh thrombus, this uh, blacker appearing, darker appearing stuff that then has you know, freshly thrombosed uh, versus that that's old. So let me go to another one. So this is a patient who came greater than 21 days. Uh, she was 36 years old, had a host of diseases, lupus, hypertension, hypothyroidism, beta thalassemia, asthma, and she had been short of breath for four weeks. But when we actually questioned her, it had been over several months that she had actually been short of breath. So just by history alone, you would suspect nothing I could do with medical therapy, et cetera, would treat uh, this disease. Uh, so she had uh, a transesophageal echo and a CT at the referring hospital. They uh, demonstrated she had right atrial thrombus, quote, quote, and so they transferred her to a center that could uh, deal with this disease. So here you see the right atrium, and you see this uh, thrombus, if you will, or debris, looks extremely bright. Uh, it looks uh, much different. Uh, more hypoechoic on the, the echo. So this is something that you would question or suspect, well, how young is this? Well, by history, it seemed old. So it wouldn't be something that I could give medical therapy. And she had act actually they had put her on medical therapy, anticoagulation, et cetera, and she hadn't had much benefit from this. 
Uh, there you see it again, right atrium, right ventricle, tricuspid valve, and here you see uh, this goober waving at you. So we took a few images uh, to find exactly where we wanted to get access. Um, and then we put uh, the catheter in from the internal jugular. Uh, when we use this catheter to go further than the right atrium, uh, we tend to go up above because you know all the, uh, it's easier to float swans, if you will, from the IJ. We usually have to have a lot of floral when we go from the femoral or inferior approach because we have to go through the RV outflow and up. So the device works much better and has a much gentler curve because it is a large Mack truck, but uh, it goes easier from up above. So we put it in, aspirated. Uh, you can see the characteristic shuddering of the little leaflets, uh, flower petals, when it's uh, grabbing thrombus. And then a uh, follow-up uh, echo shows that there's uh, gross removal of, of, of debris uh, from the atrium. Uh, this is what it looked like. You don't see any fresh thrombus on here. On looking at echo uh, and on CT, et cetera, there was a suspect that this was tumor and not thrombus uh, because that doesn't really look like thrombus. But uh, there it is again. Uh, but on the uh, pathology report, uh, it demonstrated that uh, there was, uh, this was organized, old, chronic thrombus uh, had completely negative on the frozen sections and on the pathology for tumor. So it actually was thrombus, but it was ancient, uh, placed there when the dinosaurs were roaming around in her heart. And so it was, uh, it was now. I'm not finished, so I've got three minutes. And so I'm going to show you uh, one more case, and then we can go. So this is a case of a patient who uh, had a VSD. They were 62, had an infarct uh, four days before. Uh, they had severe three-vessel disease. Um, they put, had a balloon pump placed, and uh, then they transferred the patient to me a week later with a new murmur. Uh, and this was after they had bypass at the outside hospital uh, and balloon pump. Uh, they had trashed the lower extremities and had blue toe syndrome. And they did an echo, and this patient had developed a large ventricular septal defect. And they were too sick at that point, already had their chest entered once uh, to get uh, a repeat surgery. And it was fresh meat that was infarcted. So surgeons, as you know, don't like to cut on that. So. Uh, the thoracic surgeons asked if we could close it uh, with uh, a percutaneous technique. So to do that, to close VSDs, I have to go from the superior vena cava. And this patient had been in ICUs, had bypass, had the anesthesiologists and residents or physicians, whatever, had placed IJs that had been indwelling for some time. And so I went to put the VSD device in and I looked at the superior vena cava, and that's what there was. Now, I'm, I don't know, I don't want to say I'm bad. I'm pretty good. I might could do this from inferior approach, from the, from the inferior vena cava, but it would, is not always successful. So I wasn't willing to do that. I wanted to go from above. It's an easy uh, path to get to the RV, uh, go across to the LV through the defect and put the device. So I said, well, I need to pull this out and go from up above, so that's what I did. I went from below with the device because it was a straight shot, uh, and I didn't want to push it out and let it embolize, so I went from the inferior vena cava with this device, uh, aspirated uh, all of that thrombus out, we did it some more, took pictures, uh, I got this little, looks like what comes in a bottle of tequila, the little worm. <laughs> so after we got through with that, uh, then I was able to go from up above with my catheters that I closed VSDs. Here's the LV, here's the RV, uh, went across, and that's uh, 
a septal closure device uh, that we put uh, in that VSD. And that's our final picture there. It takes these uh, a little while to thrombose. This is a porous material and it takes them, you have to get them off anticoagulation for them to completely thrombose, but good position. And this device allowed that patient to get their VSD treated. So with that, I have 23 seconds for questions and I'll end. <laughs> Any questions? Well, Mike, Mike's here. Where's Jeff? Jeff here? Mike, Jeff's not here yet. Um, so Mike, Brown, and I are going to do our first angiovac case uh, Monday. All right. Yes, yeah, so we're really excited about doing the simulation. And you know, I've been talking to these guys and learning about it for a uh, couple of years. And uh, finally, we're going to do it. So what are you removing? It's an a, a, a inferior cava ilio uh, thrombus. So the, what you really want to do after you pull it out is you'll want to put it on a table and do your oohs and ahs and take pictures. And so the most important thing you can learn about this device is how to take that filter and open it. You know how to do that? We're going to learn. We're going to learn today. It's with a great big hammer. Really? That's the way you open it. Mike, bring your hammer. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.